Hello everyone, I'm Stephen St. Palm, an ordained reverend for Life Church. I'm a chaplain for Life Church, a priest for Life Church. I'm also a preceptor for Life Church. I'm also a preacher for Life Church, you all. I have a doctor in Vini, doctor in Manitism, doctor in Ministry, doctor in Metaphysics, honor course, I'm a professor of theology. As we move into the month of February, a lot has happened here in the U.S., has it not? We've witnessed the continued changes in the Christians, the rise of anger and hatred, politics, etc., as well as maliciousness and malevolence in them, and their threats of violence, such calls for civil war, spiritual enthrallment they are experiencing, which is stemming from their particular idolatry, Trumpism, as well as their actual violence against people they hate, race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. In last week's sermon, we talked about 1 John chapter 2 and those who teach false doctrines and where their true allegiance is, as well as why a Christian must be of love. So this week, we will be looking at one of the many causes of spiritual deaths and spiritual decay here in America, of which has become more prominent these days, as those who are not of Christ do malicious acts with malevolent intent and call themselves Christians, of whom spout threats of violence or worse in public spaces. So the leading causes of the transformation of people who were Christians into something they aren't is the spirit of anger and Christian nationalism, which culminated in the events of January 6th of last year, as well as continued strife and spiritual degradation in many Christian churches as Christians as of current here in America. So before we go into deep into this theological exploration, let's look at the definitive emotion slash spirit that runs rapid with those who are beings of hatred, anger. So what is the biblical definition of anger? According to Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology, anger is defined as strong emotional reaction of displeasure, often leading to plans for revenge or punishment. There are many words for anger in Hebrew and Greek, orge and thumas. Sorry about the butchering of those, by the way, for those who are fluent in Greek and Hebrew are used for more or less interchangeably. Link in the description, by the way. According to the KJV Dictionary, anger is defined as a violent passion of a mind excited by a real or supposed injury, usually accompanied with a propensity to take vengeance or to obtain satisfaction from the offending party. This passion, however, varies in degrees of violence and in ingenious minds may be attended only with a desire to reprove or chide the offender. Anger is also excited by an injury offered to a relation, friend, or party in which one is attached, and some degrees of it may be excited by cruelty, injustice, or oppression offered to those with whom one has no immediate connection or even to the community of which one is a member, nor is it unusual to see something of his passion roused by gross absurdities in others, especially in controversy or discussion. Anger may be inflamed till it rises to rage and temporary delirium, to excite anger, to provoke, to rouse resentment. Link in the description, by the way. According to the ATS Bible Dictionary, anger is defined as a violent emotion of a painful nature, sometimes arriving spontaneously upon just occasion, but usually characterized in the Bible as a great sin. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, Colossians 3, 8. Even when just, our anger should be mitigated by due consideration of the circumstances of the offense and the state of mind of the offender or of the folly and ill results of this passion, of the claims of the gospel, and of our own need for forgiveness from others, but especially from God, Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. Anger is in scripture frequently attributed to God, Matthew 7, 11, Matthew chapter 20, 20. Not that he is liable to those violent emotions which this passion produces, but figuratively speaking, that is, after the manner of men, and because he punishes the wicked with severity of a superior provoked to anger. Link in description, by the way. These are very clear definitions concerning anger. So going off anger and knowing QAnon Trump supporters slash Proud Boys Christian Nationalists are wrathful, what is human wrath's definition? According to the International Bible Standard Encyclopedia, human wrath is defined as wrath when used of man is the exhibition of an enraged sinful nature and is therefore always inexcusable. Look at this. Galatians chapter 5.4. Genesis 49.7, Proverbs 19.19, Job 5.2, Luke 4.28, 2 Corinthians 12.10, Galatians 5.20, Ephesians 4.31, Colossians 3.8, see, there's the Galatians. It is for this reason that man is forbidden to allow anger to display itself in his life. He is not to give place under wrath, Romans chapter 12, verse 19, margin, nor must he allow the sun to go down upon his wrath, Ephesians 4.26. He must not be angry with his brother, Matthew 5.22. But seek agreement with him, lest the judgment that will necessarily fall upon the wrath will be meted out to him. Matthew chapter 5, verse 26 and 25. Particularly, it is the manifestation of an angry spirit, keywords, angry spirit, prohibited in the training 
And bring up on the family, Ephesians chapter 6, 4, Colossians 3, 19. Anger at all times is prohibited. Numbers 18, 5, Psalm 37, 8, Romans 12, 19, Galatians 5, 19, Ephesians 4, 26, James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Link in the description, by the way. So what does the Bible say about anger? It's quite a lot, actually. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to the sensuality greed to practice every kind of impurity. By that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming you have heard of him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put away your old self which belongs in your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires may be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Be angry and do not sin. Again, do not let the sun go down in your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good as building up, as it fits the occasion, that we may give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Key words. Wrath, anger, and malice. So maliciousness. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And that is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32, English Standard Version. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil, for the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. And that's Psalms chapter 37, verses 8 through 9. But I say, walk by the spirit and you not gratify the desires of the flesh for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do but if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law now the works of the flesh are evidence sexual morality impurity sensuality idolatry sorcery enmity strife jealousy fits of anger rivalries dissensions divisions envy drunkenness orgies and things like these i warned you as i warned you before that those who do such things will not hear the kingdom of god so idolatry so Trumpism, for example, fits anger, which is what we're talking about today. Sentience, divisions, which we'll also be talking about. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. That's Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25. Again, when it comes to being a Christian, we have to exemplify the fruits of the spirits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and have self-control. Those who do not exemplify the fruits of the spirit, the Holy Spirit is not in them, and they therefore are not of Christ. We Christians have to exemplify the fruits of the spirit in our daily lives, in our interactions with others. And in and of itself, there is no exception to this. The Bible is very clear on anger and that it is sinful because it leads to malicious and malevolent actions, especially physical harm to others, if not murders. So what is the theological definition of anger? Here is an excerpt from the theological definition of anger according to Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology. The anger of God, unlike pagan gods whose tires reflect the fickleness of their human creators, Yahweh expresses his wrath every day because he is a righteous judge, Psalm 711. At the same time, God is merciful and not easily provoked to anger, Exodus 43 4, 6, and Psalm 103, 88 through 9. God may choose to display his wrath within historical events, as in Israel's wilderness wanderings, Psalm 95, <coughs> verses 10 through 11, or the Babylonian exile, Lamentations chapter 2, verses 21 through 22. But his wrath will be fully expressed on the Desiree, the day of wrath at the end of the age, when all wrongs will be punished. Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 through 18. John the Baptist warns of God's fiery judgment, Matthew 3, 7. Jesus will execute God's wrath at his second coming, Revelation chapter 6 verses 15 through 17. 
While the wicked already stand under God's condemnation, John 3, 36, Ephesians 2, verse 3, by sinning they continue to store up wrath, Romans chapter 2, verse 5, Romans chapter 9, verse 22. But God, in his mercy, sent Jesus to turn away his anger by a sacrifice of appropriations, Romans chapter 3, verse 25, Romans chapter 5, verse 9, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. Some have doubted whether a God of love can experience anger towards his creatures. The Jewish philosopher Philo championed the Stoic idea that a perfect being, by definition, could not become angry. In the 20th century, H. C. H. Dodd held that the wrath of God is merely symbolic of the fact that sin has consequences. But such viewpoints reveal more about the writer's theological assumptions than the consistent teaching of the Bible. Human anger. The Bible usually portrays human anger as sinful. Cain's ire would have been turned to good if he had repented and offered an acceptable sacrifice, but by nursing his wrath against a holy God and the righteous Abel, he ends up committing murder. And that's Genesis chapter 4, verses 3-8. through eight. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. <clears throat> so warns Psalm 37, 8. In contrast with our modern emphasis on the constructive uses of anger, Proverbs urges us to think carefully before expressing anger. Proverbs 12, 16, Proverbs 14, 29, Proverbs 19, 11, to be patient, Proverbs 16, 32, and to show restraint, Proverbs 29, 11. Angry people cause conflicts, 29, 22, and 30, 33, and continually get themselves in trouble, Proverbs 19, 19. They should be avoided, Proverbs chapter 22, verses 24 through 25. In biblical history, Saul stands out as the embodiment of sinful rage, 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 9 through 10, 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 30 through 34. On the other hand, Job and many psalmists display anger and frustration with their situation and at times even with God himself. In the end, Job is rebuked because he doubted God's justice, see chapters 35 through 36. But the psalmist's prayers are acceptable, apparently, because they are viewing the world from God's perspective since God knows the heart. It is better for them to voice their anger than it is to deny it. Jesus warns that angry people will face God's judgment. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. See Galatians chapter 5, verse 20. Colossians chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. James reflects the wisdom of the Old Testament when he tells his readers to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. James chapter 1, verse 9. According to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 27, people should speak truthfully, but their anger should be restrained, short-lived, and used for righteous ends provoking one another to anger without reason in and of itself is sin, Ephesians chapter 6, 4. Anger can divide a church, 2 Colossians chapter 12, verse 20, and frustrate prayer, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. An elder must not be quick-tempered, Titus chapter 1, verse 7. People may, however, react to sin in the way that God does in holiness and without desire for personal vengeance, Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21. Moses was therefore justly angry with Pharaoh, Exodus chapter 11, verse 8, but Jesus, the God-man, gave us the best example of how to express righteous anger, Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 36, Mark chapter 3, verse 5, Mark chapter 11, verses 15 and 17, John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. At the same time, people may believe that their anger is warranted when it is not. Such anger is usually rooted in the desire to justify oneself, Simon and Levi's slaughter of the Shechemites goes well beyond righteous anger. Genesis chapter 34 verses 1 through 37. Genesis chapter 49 verses 5 through 7. Jonah believed that he was right to be angry with God. God spares the wicked. Chapter 4. Those who angrily oppose Jesus think that God is on their side. Matthew chapter 21 verses 15 through 16. So the Christian nationalists believe God is on their side, which is not because they go against every tenant and testament of Christ, and their hatred and anger separates them from God, and they oppose Jesus subsequently, knowingly or otherwise, because again, actions do matter, and so do words. Even the disciples are self-righteously angry with James and John, Matthew chapter 20, verse 24, and with the women who anointed Jesus with costly ointment. Mark chapter 14, verses 4 through 5. Link in the description, by the way. Here's an excerpt from the theological article, Is Anger a Sin? by Meg Butcher. Human anger is usually portrayed as sinful in Scripture, Bakery of Angelic Dictionary of Biblical Theology, and anger against God is always a sin. 
Anger becomes a sin when it is allowed to boil over, unconstrained, resulting in hurt being multiplied and leaving destruction in its wake. Dave Jenkins wrote for Christianity.com. Proverbs 19.11 says, A person's wisdom yields patience. It is one's glory to overlook an offense. This is the opposite of the way society is wired to react. Feetful of status updates claim their right to be offended. The justification of offenses everywhere permeating every topic of conversation. But the Bible is clear about which offenses rightly justify an angered response. Christians are to turn away vindictive anger and avoid revenge. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20 says, For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want to be. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of anger, selfish ambitions, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21 states, The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warned you, as I w did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And finally, Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, begs us to rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. God takes the sin of anger seriously. It is lumped in with many other behaviors we would not question as sinful behavior. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus warns that angry people will face God's judgment. And according to Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 27, people should speak truthfully, but their anger should be restrained, short-lived, and used for righteous ends. Link in the description, by the way. Here's an excerpt from spreadjesus.org concerning the biblical definition of anger. Sudden outbursts of temper are one fruit of sinful human nature. The Bible therefore repeatedly pictures the evils of such behavior and warns of God's people to avoid it. Genesis chapter 49, verses 6 or 7, Psalm 37, 8, Galatians 5, 19 through 20, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 through 32, Colossians 3, 8. Uncontrolled anger can have far reaching consequences, producing violent and, and even murder. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22, Luke chapter 4, 28, 29, Acts 7, 54. Acts uh, 7, verses 57 through 58. Acts chapter 21, verses 27 through 36. It is important that a person in a position of responsibility in the church is, will not be quick-tempered. Titus chapter 1, verse 7. Yet, there may be causes where it is right to be angry. Those who are faithful to God should be angry at all forms of sin, whether that sin be rebellion against God or wrongdoing against other people. Exodus chapter 16, verse 20. Exodus chapter 32, verse 19. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 5. Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 6 through 7. Matthew chapter 18, verses 32 through 34. But because human nature is affected by sin, people find it difficult to become angry at, and at the same time not to go beyond the limits that God allows. Psalms 4.4, 4, Psalms 106, verses 32 through 33. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Certainly, it is wrong for people to be so angry that they try to take personal revenge. God's people must be forgiving and leave God to deal with those who do them wrong. Leviticus 19.18, Romans 12, verses 19-21. If in resisting wrongdoing, they are guilty of bad temper. They should not try to excuse their behavior by claiming they are carrying out God's righteous purposes. James chapter 1, verses 19-20. So like a lot of Christian nationals do or Trump supporters for that matter. Claiming that they are carrying out God's righteous purposes, when in fact that again, that hatred and anger separates them from God, and they end up doing Lucifer's work for him. Because Lucifer uses those with hatred in their hearts to do unspeakable evils, and again, in the bit we will be talking about the spirit of anger, and the spirit of hatred, specifically. Anger, again, is clearly defined. Theologically, and yes, it is a sin, for it leads to numerous evils very rapidly, as we've seen with extremism. It has been irrevocably proven that Lucifer uses those with hatred in their hearts to do unspeakable evils, using the spirit of anger. Anger, of course, is also a spirit-slash-demonic spirit, as we learned in my spiritual enthrallment sermon. Here's a quick refresher. According to the article, 
The Different Types of Demonic Spirits on BibleKnowledge.net by Michael Bradley specifies Satan still has not changed his tactics and strategies, and he still uses both demons and other people to try to get us to fall into various types of sin. But whether we are coming under any kind of direct influence from demons or other people, the choice will always remain with us as to whether or not we will fall for the temptation of sin directly against God. All demons can do is try to make you do the bad and evil things, and unless you are dealing with a case of temporary possession or someone who has become mentally ill in some way, most of the time the person will have all of the senses fully intact enough to know right from wrong, and will know what the full consequences of the other acts will be if they decide to go all the way through with it. A good example are the people who murder their loved ones in a fits of anger and jealousy. Many of the times these crimes are premeditated, which means the person is actually thinking about it and planning on how to do it. Once they go into this kind of a planning stage, the demons will then keep the pressure on from the back end to try to get them to fall all the way through it. But the person can still stop and call it off any time they want to. They know full well what the consequences are going to be if they get caught, life imprisonment, or the death penalty. But in many of these cases, they still will fall all the way through with it and actually kill their spouse, whoever else they have targeted. Demons with function names of murder, rage, and hate are many of the times the driving force behind these types of horrible crimes. But again, the person is still fully cooperating with these demons with their free will, and as a result, they will be held totally accountable and responsible by both the law if they are ever caught and by God himself once they die and cross over to face him head on for their own personal judgment. So, in and of itself, for example, the events of January 6th, where all these idolaters, concerning their Messiah, rioted, insurrection, and uh, wanted all these specific uh, political enemies of Trump to be hanged and killed. Because in and of itself, the events of January 6th was a demonic assault. Because the spirits of anger and hatred consumed them. And again, Lucifer uses those as patriot and hearts to do unspeakable evils. And again, when it comes to idolatry, people are enchanted, spiritually enthralled. So, all the Trump supporters were spiritually enthralled. So, what happened on January 6th, again, in and of itself, was demonic in the fact of they are given into temptation slash demonic suggestion and carried out their assault. And we'll be getting a little deeper into this as I go on. Most of the time people have no idea that it really is demons who are operating behind the scenes providing more fuel to their fires with what they specialize in, such as the spirits of hate, murder, jealousy, rage, anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness. Once a group of these types of demons attach to a person who may have been really hurt in a love affair or a spouse being divorced by another spouse, or a spouse catching another spouse in an adulterous love affair, they will then try and do everything they can to slime the person with what they specialize in so to try to get them to act out on these negative feelings and emotions. These types of demons, and the ones who specialize in the occult, are the two worst kinds of demons you can ever come across. And this first group are the demons who specialize in trying to set people up to murder and kill. This will include demons who will try and get people to either kill themselves in the form of a suicide or kill other people in cold-blooded murders. This is not a day that goes by where we do not see reported in our local news the murder or suicide of individual people in this life. In fact, it is so common and so prevalent that we become so literally desensitized to all of this since we hear about it so much on a daily basis, it is only when it happens to someone who may be close to us that we are given the full realization of how evil an act of murder and suicide really is. And, it, and if it should happen very close to loved one like your child, your spouse, or a parent, it will rip your heart into a million pieces and leave a hole in your soul that will never fully go away until you cross over to the other side to be with Jesus for all eternity. 
through the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, God can heal the emotional wounds of this kind of trauma, but you will never lose the actual memory of the event or the sadness at losing a close loved one with such a horrible, evil, and senseless fashion. The Bible already has given us a fair warning that Satan and his demons have come to steal, kill, and destroy, and until Jesus comes back from the steps of Malam came from the city of Jerusalem, we are all going to have to battle this kind of evil reality on a regular basis, whether we like it or not. As such, it will really help everyone if they can learn how the enemy will try and operate against them. Here are some of the main function names of the demons who specialize in this kind of extreme evil activity. Murder, hate, rage, anger, violence, death, revenge, destruction, darkness, suicide, jealousy, sadism, fighting. As we have said before, demons usually travel into groups or clusters of one demon being the chief demon, the rest of the demons being his underlings under his direct control and direction. In the many of these types of cases, the chief demon will be the spirit of murder, and then he will have his underlings having some of the function names listed above. They will then move in and set up shot on someone if they have the appropriate legal price to be able to do so, and they will then try and work and play that person over a period of time to either try and get them to kill themselves or other people, or possibly both as murder, suicides are still very common in this age and day. Again, in most of these cases, a person is not in a fully possessed state. They are still have most, if not all, their senses fully intact and no basic right from wrong. The demons will then plant their thoughts, their suggestions, their pictures in the mind's eye, and their strategies on how to do this, but the person can still resist these types of evil temptations at any time and choose not to act out on, on them. Demons cannot make you do anything against your own free will. All they can do is try and persuade you to do it, along with trying to give you the actual desire and compulsion to want to do it. From there, the choice will be up to that person as to whether or not they will want to go all the way through with it and actually act out these evil desires being implanted in them by the demons. It simply amazes me how so many people will blindly follow these kinds of evil demonic suggestions and promptings and actually carry out the acts of pure cold-blooded murders on either themselves or anyone else the demons have targeted for them. Just because you get an evil thought or a desire to kill either yourself or someone else does not mean that you actually try and carry it out. So, again, when it comes to events of January 6th or any acts of extremism here in America by Christian nationalists or Trump supporters, QAnon. In and of itself, it's the same evil regardless. Again, people need to be taught the basis of how demons will try and play mind games with you so they can try to get you to do their evil bidding. The mind is a battlefield in the area of spiritual warfare with both demons and God trying to reach you through your mind. God will be trying to transform and renew your mind through his word, and demons will try to reach your mind so they can get you to act out their evil suggestions. Link in the description, by the way. Again, through watching and observing the transformations of people who were Christians, but became something else due to their hero worship of Trump, which hero worship is defined as idolatry, they embrace a conspiracy such as QAnon as well as violence to gain what they seek in their beliefs of Christian nationalism, giving the temptations of demons to carry out harm on others. Again, all of it is not of Christ. So what is the definition of Christian nationalism? According to the article of Christianity Today entitled, What is Christian Nationalism? Christian nationalism is defined as, you've probably seen headlines recently about the evils of Christian nationalism, especially since December's Jericho March in Washington, D.C., and since the mob of Trump supporters, many sporting Christian slogans, signs, symbols, etc., were rioting and storming the U.S. Capitol building on January 6th. What is Christian nationalism, and how is it different from Christianity? What is nationalism? There are many definitions of nationalism and an active debate on, on how best to define it. I've reread the standard academic literature on nationalism and found several recurring themes. Most scholars agree that nationalism starts with the belief that humanity is divisible into mutually distinct, internally coherent cultural groups defined by shared traits like language, religion, ethnicity, or culture. From there, scholars say nationalists believe that these groups should each have their own governments, that governments should promote and protect a nation's cultural identity, that sovereign national groups provide meaning and purpose for human beings. What is Christian nationalism? 
Christian nationalism is a belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way. Popularly, Christian nationalists assert that America is and must remain a Christian nation, not merely as an observation about American history, but as a prescriptive program for what America must continue to be in the future. Scholars like Samuel Huntington have made a similar argument that America is defined by its Anglo-Protestant past and that we will lose our identity and our freedom if we do not preserve our cultural inheritance. Christian nationalists do not reject the First Amendment and do not advocate for theocracy, but they do believe that Christianity should enjoy a privileged position in the public square. The term Christian nationalism is relatively new, and its advocates generally do not use it on themselves, but it, it accurately describes American nationalists who believe American identity is extremely from Christianity. What is the problem with nationalism? I mean, outside of authoritarianism, regardless if it's left or right. Humanity is not easily divisible into mutually distinct cultural units. Cultures overlap and their borders are fuzzy. Since cultural units are fuzzy, they make a poor fit as the foundation for a political order. Cultural identities are fluid and hard to draw boundaries around, but political boundaries are hard and semi-permanent. Attempting to found political legitimacy on cultural likeness means political order will constantly be in danger of being felt as illegitimate by some group or another. Cultural pluralism is essentially inevitable in every nation. Is that really a problem or just an abstract worry? It is a serious problem. When nationalists go about constructing their nation, they have to find who is and who is not part of the nation. But there are always the sense in minorities who do not or cannot conform to the nation nationalist preferred cultural template. In the absence of moral authority, nationalists can only establish themselves by force. So, for example, we look at authoritarian countries like uh, China, for example, or communist China, for example, and then, of course, we also have Russia. And when it comes down to the modern era, we also had uh, fascist Italy and we had Nazi Germany, and in and of itself, it all led to besides a lot of genocides and everything else. Pure and unadulterated evil. Scholars are almost unanimous that nationalist governments tend to become authoritarian and oppressive in practice, for example, in past generations, to the extent that the United States had a quasi-established official religion of Protestantism, but did not respect the true religious freedom Worse, the United States and many individual states use Christianity as a prop to support slavery and segregation. So the Confederata is, pretty much. So again, whenever, so when the people of their Southern pride and uh, Confederate everything, in and of itself, again, segregation and slavery and oppression in and of itself. So, again, still all that evil. What do Christian nationalists want that is different from normal Christian engagement in politics? Christian nationalists want to define America as a Christian nation, and they want the government to promote a specific cultural template as the official culture of the country. Some have advocated for an amendment to the Constitution to recognize America's Christian heritage, others to reinstate prayer in public schools, some work to enshrine a Christian nationalist interpretation of American history and school curricula, including that America has a special relationship with God or has been chosen by him to carry out a special mission on earth. Others advocate for immigration restrictions, specifically to prevent and change America's religious and ethnic demographics. Or to change to American culture, so that ethnic demographics. So, as we saw with the Trump administration, that incredibly, excruciatingly racist immigration policy, with which, again, Trump supporters were apathetic to evil there, either complicit or complacent to it. God will not hold that guiltless. And to be fair, Biden is still following Trump's immigration policy, and I didn't support Trump because of the immigration policy amongst numerous other things because of his malicious and malevolent nature and I definitely don't support Biden either 
specifically because of him following Trump's immigration policy. I'm using COVID-19 as an excuse. <clears throat> Anyways, when it comes to my politics-wise, I am nonpartisan. But then it comes down to itself, God first, family second, country last. For me personally, not any rate. Some want to empower the government to take stronger action to circumscribe immoral behavior. Some, again, like the scholar Samuel Huntington, have argued that the United States government must defend and enshrine its predominant Anglo-Protestantism culture. So, good amount of racism right there. I know, so, all these people who, well, again, they were Christian originally, but hatred separates them from God. To enshrine the survival of American democracy, and sometimes Christian nationalism is most evident, not in its political agenda, but in the sort of attitude with which is held an unstated presumption that Christians are entitled to primacy of place in the public square because they are heirs to the true or essential heritage of American culture, that Christians have a presumptive right to define the meaning of the American experiment because they see themselves as America's architects, first citizens, and guardians. How is this dangerous to America? Hmm. Well, outside of extremism, genocide, authoritarianism. There's a lot, actually. Christian nationalism tends to treat other Americans as second-class citizens. If it were fully implemented, it would not respect the full religious liberties of Amer all Americans. Empowering the state through moral legislation to regulate conduct always carries the risk of overreaching, setting a bad precedent, and creating governing powers that could be used later against Christians. And we saw this in Nazi Germany. Because in and of itself, uh, Hitler and the occult. And they wanted to replace Christ Christianity as a state religion. So in and of itself. Those Christians that followed wholeheartedly became twisted and corrupted because of that spiritual involvement. And we saw that then, historically, and we are having this now, too, still, for the four years of Trump and beyond. But again, it is anti-Christ, so it's not of God, not of Jesus, certainly. So there is only one thing that it can be, the, op the opposite of Christ, the opposite of God, so evil. Additionally, Christian nationalism is an idol ideology held overwhelmingly by white Americans and is thus tends to exasperate racial and ethnic cleavages. In recent years, the movement has grown increasingly characterized by fear and by a belief that Christians are victims of persecution, which here in America they aren't at all, honestly. Some are beginning to argue that American Christians need to prepare to fight physically to preserve America's identity, an argument that played into the January 6th riots. And, of course, in and of itself, prepared to physically fight, that goes against Christ's tenets and testaments of being of peace, so again, not of Christ. <sighs> so, Antichrist. How is Christian nationalism dangerous to the church? Christian nationalism takes the name of Christ for a worldly political agenda proclaiming that its program is a political program for every true believer that is wrong in principle no matter what the agenda is because only the church is authorized to proclaim the name of Jesus to carry his standard into the world it is even worse with political movement that champions some causes that are unjust which is a case with Christian nationalism and its attendant illiberalism in that case Christian nationalism is calling evil good and good evil and is taking the name of Christ as a fig leaf to cover its political program, treating the message of Jesus as a tool of political propaganda and the church as the handmaiden and cheerleader of the state. Link in description, by the way. Christian nationalism is not just heretical. As stated in the Bible and theology, we Christians are one church across the world. We are of Christ and have unity in Christ. Those who are Christian nationalists do 
intend to divide that which they are spiritually to not do, doing Lucifer's work for him. They are marked as such spiritually, and we see the results of it. But also the false doctrines and false beliefs. We see the spirit of anger so prevalent in Christians, those that gave way to Christian Christianism, Trumpism these days, making them no longer of peace, love, and they don't follow majesty in God's image. First John chapter 4, verses 7 to 21 let alone any of Christ's tenets and testaments. We see the failure of them exemplifying the fruits of the Spirit as well, with hatred and anger, both being driving force for them, which again in Galatians chapter 5, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, and that's Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. The reality of this transformation of these Christians into fallenness is that they no longer inherit the kingdom of God due to the hatred and anger being both separation from God. Lucifer's aim is to take as many souls with him, so his tactics of separation from God are very evident. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 through 27. The Bible and theology states there are things that will legitimately make us angry, but for us to not sin, which sin is defined as harming others, especially unnecessarily. Many of these Christians fail in this, sinning and harming others and believing they have a right to do as they please to others, especially in that anger. The Bible also states, do not let the sun go down in your anger, as in you must relinquish that anger and forgive others for their trespasses of whom you are angry with, and do not let that spirit, anger, consume you, which will give opportunity to the devil to devour and harm through the actions of the said individual, because again, it is a spirit of which is demonic temptation. We must not fall into those temptations and give no opportunity to the devil, for he will act in our actions of anger, wrath, and hatred, especially. So, when it comes down to Trump supporters, QAnon, etc., and Christian nationalism, so when it comes to Hebrews chapter 6, concerning uh, church discipline, so the winnowing, and I'll be reading from the Compact uh, Baker Dictionary of Theological Terms. So church discipline, the process of rebuking and correcting sinful members of the church. It consists of four steps. Matthew 18, chapter 15 to 20. Personal confrontation, rebuke by two or three people, admonition by the whole church, and excommunication. Or removal from membership. And this is the point of where we act as when it comes to Christianity here in America, over when it comes to looking at research polls and everything else, there's over 21 million Americans who believe the last election was stolen from their Messiah, Trump. So they are all guilty of idolatry at the very least. And they have to be excommunicated until they repent and repent. Because Lucifer is going to continue to use that hatred and anger. And so let's look at the term of excommunication. Mm. Excommunication. The last stage of the process of church discipline, following the failure of the first stage of personal confrontation, and the second stage of two to three, one to one confrontation, and the third stage of the whole church rebuke and admonition, the church is to excommunicate the unrepentant member and treat that person as a non-Christian. And that is the point of what we have to do with Christian nationalism, Trump supporters, QAnon, etc. We have to treat those who are of hatred, those who are so much anger, those who harm others so unnecessarily, who call themselves Christian, because we have to, the realization is, is that they are no longer of Christ, they are not Christians, and we have to correctly mark them as such in our interactions, and we have to pray wholeheartedly for their salvation, because they are not Christians officially. So anyone who fails to match this day is not of Christ. So anyone who's racist, xenophobic, extremism, etc. 
not at Frank's. And they are excommunicated. This actually entails removal from church membership and ministry, exclusion from the Lord's Supper and rupture of relationship with the church and with God. The purpose of excommunication is restoration. The church hopes and prays for repentance. And that is key. We have to pray for their repentance and atonement. And once they do repent and atone for the things that they do, then we will hardly accept them back. But until such is a time, we have to treat them as no longer Christ and not Christians. Okay. Which leads to a reinstatement of the excommunicated person. Yep. Know your terminology. Here are a few excerpts from an exorcist that explains the demonic, the antics of Satan, and his army of fallen angels concerning this. The loss of a sense of sin that characterizes our error helps Satan to act nearly undisturbed and inducing man to sin takes man progressively away from the love of God. Everything is lawful. What is wrong there? Everyone does it. These are the suggestions that weaken the consciousness of men and women and lead them on the path towards closing their hearts, egoism, lack of forgiveness, and doing everything for money, sex, and power. Everything that seduces and saves souls leads to their death, which is Satan's objective. The ordinary temptations of the devil are played mainly in the area of intelligence. Let us think of the many theoretical errors that are passed off as modern ideas in order to unhinge the principles of the face, as in all the new lifestyles that are contrary to morality. What is the cause of this moral decline? Principally, it is the diminution of the Christian conscience and the struggles against the powers of darkness. It is St. Paul who warns us, for we are not con contending against the flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 6, 12. Here's how Vatican II frames the situation. When the order of values is jumbled and bad is mixed with the good, individuals and groups pay heed solely to their own interests and not to those of others. Thus it happens that the world ceases to be a place of true brotherhood. In our own day, the magnified power of humanity threatens to destroy the race itself. For a monumental struggle against the power of the darkness, the whole history the whole history of man. The battle was joined from the very origin of the world and will continue until the last day, as the Lord has attested. In Matthew chapter twenty four thirteen, chapter thirteen, verses twenty three to thirty, and verses thirty six through forty three. Caught in this conflict, man is obligated to wrestle constantly if he is to cling to what is good nor can he achieve his own integrity without great efforts and the help of God's grace. Link in the description, by the way. Christian nationalists and Christians that are fallen mix the bad with the good and are subsequently corrupted and are no longer of Christ. Those who fail majesty as well as giving the spirit of anger, being wrathful, malicious, and malevolent, racist, xenophobes, Christian nationalism, extremists, aren't Christians officially or otherwise, and I have to affirm this as a legally ordained reverend. We Christians are called to peace. During the events of January 6th of last year, we saw spiritual enthrallment as well as fallen Christians who gave the demonic suggestion slash temptation in fighting for a rioting, insurrecting against the lawful election, all for their Messiah, Trump, which is idolatry to begin with. Several people died that day and more were injured. Christian nationalism was standard point in those events and still are in more current events here in the United States. You even hear Christian nationalist preachers such as Pastor Locke has pushed COVID-19 misinformation and previously ran the pandemic as fake. He also discouraged his supporters from getting inoculated against the virus during his sermons. He has embraced debunked conspiracy theories related to the 2020 presidential election and insisted that Biden is not legitimately voted in. Link in the description for that, by the way. And of course, that and all that in and of itself is damnation. In and of itself. So, that idolatry. And that pushing of everything that is not a cross, that is everything that's not loving my neighbor, either. And people like that as is the same type of antichrist that the Apostle John talks about in First John chapter two, the same type of malicious and malevolence, which again is routinely warned against in the New Testament. I don't disagree with burning Ouija board or tarot cards incidentally. I really don't actually. 
Like, for example, when it came down to last Christmas, I bought uh, some Harry Potter stuff for a family member who's still really into all that stuff. And uh, suffice it to say, I got bombarded with advertisements for for all this witchcraft uh, sets and stuff like that. You know, like actual books on magic and stuff. It's like, yeah. So I don't disagree with the assertion that that type of stuff in and of itself is demonic. And again, we're warned, just in Catholic texts, that uh, to no longer watch uh, like horror films, um, demons and stuff like that, because in and of itself, everything we watch and see, we become of, necessarily. Which I'll be talking about in a little bit, actually. But in John Locke's case, if the book burnings do consist of books right-wingers don't particularly like concerning certain past presents or books about the Holocaust, etc., thus it's a perennial problem. It is the kettle calling the pot black. Both are equally corrupted and equally not of Christ nor God. This is not a demonization of the subject, Christian Aslam. However, it is admonishment, though. Because when it comes down to condemnation, when you're condemning someone, you are believing that the person cannot be redeemed. And that, in and of itself, uh, puts the Lord's name in vain, because it goes against uh, Jesus coming here save every single person from their sins, because everyone can be redeemed, no matter what. This is what we Christians are taught to believe, and this is a doctrinal teaching, no matter which denomination you belong in. So to go against that, which a lot of these fire and brimstone pastors are putting the Lord's name in vain. So. We Christians have to be proponents of change. We have to believe everyone can be redeemed, because we ourselves can fall equally. And God will have to direct our lives to have us return back to being redeemed. And he does that a lot. And this is why we are encouraged to pray for others, because prayer is an intercession and is love. And this is why I admonish, because I rebuke. But do I condemn? I can condemn actions, I don't condemn people. Because in and of itself, those people are already self-condemned. But we have to be of love, and we have to love everyone, regardless if there are neighbors or those who wish to do us harm. And this is why, when it comes to admonishment, though, we have to put people to accountability, legally, moral accountability. And then thus, this is part of why I've been given the church discipline mission. Because I have to admonish. And then I have to pray repeatedly for people, and I have to pray against Christians who fell. And then of course, I get to watch while all their lives completely turn into millions of pieces. And then God re-enters them and heals them. And in and of itself, that's, for me, that's pretty scary, because I, again, I did not know what God is going to do to have to change them. But I have to trust that God will be merciful and be good, because God had it in my life twice to change my ways, because I felt just like everyone else, I felt a cheap grace as well. And the second time was quite painful, but if he hadn't done that, then I wouldn't have become eventually ordained, so. And so it's important, because in and of itself, every person matters. However, it is a monument, though, for we, as people, let alone as Christians, are known by our actions and our words, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit, Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, King and Version. Our actions and words define us, and yes, we will be judged accordingly by believers, non-believers, and especially God in the final judgment. Like, for example, some months ago, a non-believer 
told me that, like in my town, that people, especially Christians, need Jesus. And given how many idolaters there are in a rural community of mine, the reality is I do not disagree, because they all fell, unfortunately. And again, non-believers can judge you accordingly. But the reality is, is God's already judging you. To the Christian has to embody the fruits of the Spirit in their daily lives. There is no exception to this. Because if you do not exemplify the fruits of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not in you, and I have to affirm this. I believe they're ordained reverend. So you have to be of love. You have to be of peace. You have to be gentle. You have to be kind. You have to be tender. You have to be compassionate and forgiving, especially. We have free will, but God created the law of consequences to counter the negative things we do do in our human nature, in which is intrinsically evil, and again, sin is defined as harming others. The same preachers slash preach, teach hatred, and subsequently aren't of Christ because hatred is separation from God, for it is the antithesis of Jesus' commandments to be of love and to be of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. In the cost of discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer elaborates on this commandment from Christ. So here is the excerpt from the cost of discipleship concerning peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The followers of Jesus have been called to peace, for he has called them. They found they in their peace, for he is their peace. But now they are told that they must not only have peace, but make it. And to that end, they renounce all violence and tumult. In the cause of Christ, nothing is gained by such methods. Lucifer's cause, however, will, always, because he uses love of hatred and hearts to the unspeakable evils, regardless if the person knows it or not. His kingdom is one of peace, and the mutual greeting of his flock is a greeting of peace. His disciples keep the peace by choosing to endure suffering themselves rather than inflict it on others, and that is very key. We Christians cannot inflict it on others, and we have to endure. All the harm instead of inflicted on others. And again, uh, all these false doctrines teach the opposite, of course. And this is why so many Christians here in America fell. Because, again, thinking about that, if you research for this, tens of millions of Christians that are no longer Christian here in America. I wouldn't say 90% of the American Christians are no longer Christian, but it's definitely way higher than 70%. And that's the downside is you are known by your actions and your words. Because when it comes to human nature, when it comes to us as humans, we are creatures of habit. And therefore, there is no out of the blue incident. Our actions and words define us. They maintain fellowship where others would break it off. They renounce all self-assertion and quietly suffer in the face of hatred and wrong. In so doing, they overcome evil with good and establish the peace of God in the midst of world of war and hate. But nowhere will that peace be more manifest than where they meet the wicked in peace and are ready to suffer at their hands. The peacemakers will carry the cross with their Lord, for it was on the cross that peace was made. Now that they are partners in Christ's work of reconciliation, they are called the sons of God as he is the Son of God. Link is description, by the way. We Christians are no longer required, are not only required to do good, but to be of good love and to be of peace. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves, to treat others as we would want to be treated, as we would treat ourselves, and to love our enemies, those who would harm us. We are to help others, less fortunate, those that are hurting the immigrant FYI, pray for others and forgive. Prayer is love. Prayer is intercession through Jesus to God. Again, we are called to peace. As we see with Christian nationalists and other fallen Christians, racists, xenophobes, idolaters, Trump supporters, they fail every tenet and testament of Christ in the spirit of anger that is in them. We see the consequences of their transformation with spats of anger and threats of violence in public spaces, especially during the pandemic. We also see the disregard of human life not safeguarding the lives by being vaccinated or wearing a mask, and of course we also see the acts of violence, vandalism, etc. 
With everything that is happening here in the U.S., knowing there can be violence or worse, we as Christians must use peacefulness in countering evil, racism, xenophobia, Christian nationalism, whenever it happens, regardless of the day. Holding those accountable, lawfully, legally, ethically, who harm others unnecessarily is ours, our first duty in regard to safeguarding life, cherishing life as good people, let alone as Christians. Those that are QAnon, Trump supporters, Christian nationalists, racist xenophobes in general, used to be good people originally, and strong Christians, but as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, things are much simpler here than we like. Not that we do not know God's commandments, but that we do not do them, then gradually, as a consequence of such disobedience, we no longer know what is right. That is our predicament. That is their predicament in truth. They fell by listening to fear-mongering, hate-mongering, not even countering or counting. Their fall, thanks to idolatry and support of Trump and their many actions, including the events of January 6th, and no longer exemplify the fruits of the Spirit and became wrathful and as aggressively proven, Lucifer uses those with hate in their hearts to do unspeakable evils. So knowing that, we as Christians have to look on them with compassion, because as our human nature, which is intrinsically evil, we can easily falter in so many ways, least of all of these is anger. When people outburst in anger and do things in their blinded anger, they give into temptation slash demonic suggestion. When I am confronted, personal life or professionally, with a fallen Christian spouting in anger, actively making threats of violence in their anger, my thoughts will be on how many spirits or demonic entities are in that person right now. Again, a demon cannot force a person to do something they don't wish to do. What will I say to make them see reason and fight that temptation slash demonic suggestion and de-escalate the situation and hold them to accountability peacefully to make sure they get the help they desperately need? There, of course, is always something to remember in reference, especially concerning temptation slash demonic suggestion, which I am reminded of in Nexus Explains the Demonic, the answer to Satan and fallen army fallen angels. So here's a few excerpts from Nexus Explains the Demonic, the answer to Satan's army of fallen angels concerning temptation and fighting it. The devil tempts us both in our natural dimension, that is, in our interior wounds and weaknesses, and through the various occasions of sin that present themselves to us. Temptation is dangerous because it is different, difficult to uncover in the folds of our thoughts, words, and works and omissions. Discernment is necessary, that is, we must have a well-trained eye and the spiritual intelligence that helps us to recognize the call of the tempter and those who bring us straight to sin, we must reject them and instead accept the good inspirations that come from God. Therefore, it is necessary to guard our heart and our external senses from indecent spectacles. Each of us becomes what we see, what we listen to, and what we read. Therefore, let us be discerning in what we see and listen to, and above all, let us choose good friends. It is necessary to have a well-formed conscience. A good conscience is not achieved by a leveling oneself, or worse yet, allowing the dominant culture to arbitrate good and bad. A good conscience is attained by conforming one's will to God's will and him to his teachings, which are given to us for our happiness and our salvation, and are summarized in highest degree in the commandments. Temptation is conquest by vigilance, avoiding sin and praying, because without the help of God, we are not capable of conquering the seduction of sin. No one is exempt from temptation. Some of the saints have had tremendous temptations even on their deathbeds. From their testimonies, we understand that as long as we have breath, we shall never be free of temptation. Lincoln's description, by the way. So knowing temptation slash demonic suggestion helps in the transformation of people who are Christians into no longer of Christ for listening to fear-mongering, hate-mongering, and giving into their anger and wrath and hatred and harming others unnecessarily, verbally or otherwise, and threatening violence, calls for civil war, doing acts of vandalism, violence, extremism, due to their human nature and their Christian nationalist beliefs. Again, it is antichrist in origin. So we Christians have to stare down that anger, threats of violence, by fallen Christians, peacefully. Knowing if we answer in kind, Lucifer still wins because the cause of Christ cannot be served by any other means except peace and love. Again, we have to die to our nature on the daily, since those that fell in their actions towards others exemplify their mental state, certainly, as well as their spiritual state. We, as Christians, have to hold that anger, wrath, and acts of hatred to accountability peacefully. That is our duty. To do otherwise is apathy to evil, complicity slash complacency to evil, which God will not hold 
count guiltless. We also must have empathy for others to have compassion through understanding of why the spiritual change in people for others and pray and hope they repent to turn and become of good and thereby reach that reconciliation in the world. Again, holding those who harm others accountable legally as love, for they will get the mental health help they desperately need. They atone for what they've done and get to learn know of God and repent. You can't have forgiveness without repentance. To do otherwise is cheap grace, which is another word for damnation, according to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We must strive for peace by peaceful means. We must counter the false doctrines taught Christian nationalism, once saved, always saved, and anything revolving around cheap grace. We must fight anger, wrath, and hatred, racism, xenophobia, and those who do such things with peace and love. There is no way around this, and knowing full well that they are fallen, lost, and cast away, to realize this, and to do our best to save them, for they are excommunicated. Because of that separation already. And we have to count them as excommunicated. But we have to save them as we try to save every single person who has fallen and lost. For we cannot abandon others and fallen Christians who do evil, knowingly or otherwise, to Lucifer. Prayer is love for his intercession between Jesus to God on our behalf. So, counting racists, xenophobes, Christian nationalists, extremists, idolaters as fallen, we must, above all, pray that God enters them and heals their hearts, minds, and souls, and that they repent and tell before it's too late. God will change them and may take hours, days, weeks, months, or even years. We must strive for others' salvation as well as guarding our own hearts. Above all, we must love others, those around us, and our enemies, those who wish to do us harm, with the infinite love of Jesus. In conclusion, as the pandemic continues, help those in your communities love others with unconditional love, give unqualified love to those who wish to do you harm, your enemies, as well as loving your neighbors, treat others as you would treat yourself, do good for others, do good works and make the world a better place by peacefulness and the love you receive from God, God's abiding love. Everything you do, do so out of love and peacefulness. Stay safe, everyone, and God bless. And I am back. Considering it's 36 degrees outside right now, I originally was going to go out into my town and actually do a concentration in general prayer for our, my town right now with everything that is currently going on here in the U.S. and everything. So instead, I will be doing it here. And as you can see, I've got anointing oil. So. You know, never to be not armed with it. Because we have to, again, go get some assassinations you know, of Lucifer and stand against all the de demons and everything. I certainly would suggest not to try to anoint a fallen Christian who's spouting so much things out of anger and hatred and threats of violence and everything. Would be funny though, but definitely don't do that. Would it work? Would that uh, exorcism work? Hmm, definitely more than likely, but that's beside the point, I think. So I'm going to be reading you some benediction prayers. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is hope, despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, 
to be loved as to love. For it is giving that we receive, it is pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. That's from St. Francis of Assisi. So, affirmation of faith. Let us continue. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolate and universal, whose holy faith let us now reverently and sincerely declare. We believe in the one God, maker and the ruler of all things, father of all men, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present us with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in the gr grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God as the sufficient rule, both of faith and practice. We believe in the church as the fellowship of the worship and for service for all who are united in the living Lord. We believe in the kingdom of God as the divine rule of human society and in the brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I come to you now. I just pray for America right now and the rest of the world. I just pray when it regards to the hatred and so much anger right now in so many people, Lord, I pray that you drive out those spirits from them and that you return those fallen Christians back to you, Lord, that you earn them, change their ways, heal their hearts, minds, bodies, and souls, no matter how long it takes, Lord. You are in control of such things. I pray for their salvation, Lord, and their redemption, because everyone on this earth can be redeemed. This is why you sent your son to be appropriation for our sins, Father God. You are in control of everything, Lord. I just pray that you bring peace and unity here in the U.S. especially, Lord. And I just pray that so many other Christians finally truly do realize what is going on spiritually with that spiritual problem in the people, Lord. And I just pray that they do what is right concerning confronting it, Lord, peacefully and with love. And I just pray, Lord, that you safeguard the lives of everyone, Lord, that is working right now. Especially those who are first responders and those in medical, Lord. Because a good amount of hospitals are being swamped by COVID-19 patients for people who are deciding to do the things that they want to do. <sighs> in their own narcissistic, self-centered beliefs and everything. And do that misinformation as well, Lord. And not let them their neighbors and they get the consequences thereof, and again, the majority of the COVID-19 deaths these days are unvaccinated, and it is incredibly sad seeing Lucifer win and so many people, continually. I just pray that you protect those who are unvaccinated, regardless, and I just pray that you protect them from dying, just as they can, that they do truly open their eyes and see the realization and decide if it's in their interests to safeguard their lives as well above the people of life, Lord. I just pray that you bring unity here in America, Lord, and you bring the peace that is needed, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Sacraments. Father, you raise your son's cross as a sign of victory and life. May all who share in the suffering find in these sacraments a source for your courage and healing. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. God of compassion, you take every family under your care and know our physical and spiritual needs. Transform our weakness by the strength of your grace and confirm us with your covenant so that we may grow in faith and love. May the God of all consolation bless you in every way and grant you hope in all the days of your life. Amen. May God restore you to health and grant you your salvation. Amen. May God fill your heart with peace and lead you to eternal life. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Lord, through these sacraments you offer us the gift of healing. May this grace bear fruit among us and make us all strong in your service. We ask this through our Christ our Lord. Amen. Anyways, everyone, stay safe and God bless.